Good morning. Good morning, Solid Ground. Good morning, friends. You may be seated. I'm just looking so, for some faces in the audience. It helps me. It helps me. You, some of you guys, when I see your faces, it gives me courage and faith. Yes. Hello, Marie. Awesome. So currently we are preaching through the book of Genesis. It's a, in a, a very exciting journey ahead. And James started two weeks ago and he preached on Genesis 1. And he preached on the God of blessing. So today I'm preaching on the God of work and the God of rest. And just to start off with, if you're not currently in a work position, for instance, you're in school, it doesn't mean you can switch off. This is very applicable to you as well. Even if you're at a stage in your life where you're really trusting God for a job, this is very relevant, relevant to see the vision of God for work and just to, to raise our own expectations and to get a biblical view on what work is all about. So you can turn in your Bibles to Genesis 1 verse 31. I'm just going to give a moment. There is power in reading the Word of God together. So as I'm reading it, I trust that God's Spirit will be at work and He will touch all of our hearts. Genesis 1 verse 31. God saw all that He had made and it was very good indeed. Evening came and then morning the sixth day. So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. On the seventh day, God had completed his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested from all his work of creation. These are the records of the heavens and the earth concerning their creation. At the time that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, no shrub of the field had yet grown on the land, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not made it rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. There was no man to work the ground, but mist would come up from the earth and water all the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust from the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and the man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he placed the man he had formed. The Lord God caused to grow out of the ground every tree pleasing in appearance and good for food, including the tree of life in the middle of the garden, as well as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river went out from Eden to water the garden. From there it divided and became the source of four rivers. The name of the first was Pishon, which flows through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. Gold from that land is pure, bedillium and onyx also was also there. So just to pause, in this verse you can see it was God's plan and he purposefully created every kind of raw material, some precious stones like gold and um, onyx God created. Verse 13, we continue. The name of the second river is Gihon, which flows through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris, which runs east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and placed him in the garden of Eden to do what? To work it and watch over it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this moment, this exact moment. Lord, you have planned for every single person that's here today. Open our hearts, open our minds, open our eyes. Let us receive your word, Father. I entrust this moment into your hands. I ask your help, Holy Spirit. Be at work. Let the word go out in power. And we thank you for your presence here, Holy Spirit. Take this moment and glorify your name in Jesus' name. Amen. The God of work and the God of rest. So Timothy Keller made a statement and he said, unless you find the biblical view of work, you will never find rest. 
So we'll come back to the statement. And I've got five points to help us to understand the biblical view of work and five points to help us understand the biblical view of rest. Are you ready? The God of work. A general um, sort of definition for work is an exchange of labor, skill and time for monetary and intrinsic rewards. Often viewed in the Bible, it's an ex exercise of stewardship. I like Dorothy Sayers, she puts the biblical doctrine of work like this. Work is the gracious expression of creative energy in the service of others. Okay, my first point, God himself worked. If you read in Genesis 2 from verse 2, on the seventh day, God had completed his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy for on it he rested from all his work of creation. God worked, he created man, male and female in his image. So it means that we are created in his image and it's part of our DNA to work, yes? Okay, so how many of you know that after a significant time of doing nothing, you become restless? So think back of the 20 day, 21 days of lockdown, if you had the privilege of not having to work from home. I mean, kitchen cupboards get rearranged, garages get packed and ordered, and husbands start planting strawberry plants, <laughs> if you can remember that sermon. So we become restless if we don't work. We are created to work. We are created to create order out of chaos, to beautify things, to create. And our first job is to mirror our creator. Yeah. Point number two, work is a blessing and not a curse. God ordained work before sin. It was part of the original design of creation, work. In verse 5 already it says, there was no man to work the ground. In verse 15, the Lord God took the man and placed him in the garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. And this was even before verse 16 only come, then God only told them about the um, tree of knowledge of good and evil. So it was long before Adam and Eve and long before the fall. The Lord God commanded Adam and Eve to work prior to the fall. So, in other words, work is a blessing and not a curse. In verse um, Genesis 3, we read about the curse. In verse 17, you can read with me. And he said to the man, the ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground, since you were taken from it. For you are dust, and you will return to dust. So toil and bad work and idolatry only came after the fall. And it's the toilsomeness of work, not work itself, that is the result of the curse in the fall. When we read about the Israelites in the wilderness, I mean, it's amazing. Manna falling from the sky, um, God providing water out of a rock. And we think that is an amazing picture. If God just supernaturally provide for us and all our needs, that is the picture of the promised land. One day when we retire and there's no work, that is the picture of the promised land. But yet God was taking the Israelites into the promised land where they would have to work. A, a land flowing with milk and honey, but they had to work for it. God taught the Israelites that they need to rely on them in the wilderness and in, in um, exchange God to tr entrust them with lots of abundance in the promised land one day. His heart is to have co-laborers, people that they, he can partner with, that reflects his God and nature to the world around us. So work is a blessing and not a curse. Point number three, every godly vocation or kind of job originated with God himself. Please don't, I'm not talking about being an assassin or something, but um, in Genesis 2 verse 8, 
the Lord God planted a garden in Eden. So he was the first gardener. He was also the first artist, the first coach, the first counselor, lawyer, doctor, and builder. So if God ordained work as a normal part of our being, as a normal rhythm of life, every kind of job, even if it seems menial to us, have value and significance. Um, Jesus Christ was a car carpenter, and he loved to dirty his hands and get into the, to the, um, just the thick of things. I mean, aren't you also grateful for people that clean up our town and sweep the streets? They create order out of chaos. They beautify. They restore like their creator. So we are called to be stewards. And as Christians, we need to seek to recreate. We need to seek renewal, reconciliation, and the redemption of situations. We are part of God's plan of redemption. He is currently making everything new. So if you see your work as an expression of the creativity of your creator, it helps us to get a, and understand a high, or get a higher view of our jobs. And we represent and we mirror the heart of the Father, our creator in the world. Point number four, there is no secular job for the believer. And I think all of us need a transformation of our minds in this. Even if you say you get this, I promise you, most of us um, view one job as more spiritual and one job as more secular. For instance, pastors and missionaries, that's more spiritual and they are in the ministry. But making steel, no, that's secular. The biblical view is rather that every believer, every single one is in ministry, no matter what your job, your current job is. So last Sunday, we, we prayed for people. It was commissioning Sunday. And our hearts were, you receive power from the Holy Spirit to be witnesses wherever you are. We sent you guys out to make a difference in the world out there where you are placed. God has a specific plan for you where, exactly where you are working right now. So you are in the ministry no matter what your job is. So let me share you a little bit of a story just to help you or to prove my point that in end of 2007, um, my, my husband just resigned his job as an engineer at Columbus and he joined the church solid ground on a full-time basis. So we were full-time elders at that stage. And God taught us many things. And one of the things was definitely, you can think that a lot of who we are and our identity we find in what we do. Yes, we know that. So if now suddenly you have to fill in a form and you write in, I am not really a pastor, but I'm an elder. What on earth does that mean? So, you know, it's like nobody even, the world doesn't understand what it is. So there's a little bit of pride in that process, yes. And we figure out that God strips us from that because our identity does not lie in what we do. But the interesting fact is what happened then was in five years, after five years in full-time ministry, God moved us back into industry and, and we moved to Joburg and in a very corporate environment. And what struck me is that I really struggled with it. Now, I mean, the world will look at you did you fail? Weren't you good enough? Weren't you holy enough? Why on earth would God move you from spending all your time on what matters now on spending going back into the corporate world? And God, one of the reasons I think he even took us there was to smash that mindset. He just set us free. And one of the first sermons we ever heard in our Joburg church was this exact thing, work is worship. And he set us free that you are a minister where you are. You make a difference and God has a plan and a purpose for you right where you are. So in our own journey, we even had religious mindsets of what is sacred and secular. And Jesus Christ gave his life so that he can remove the lines between sacred and secular. On the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. On the cross, the veil was torn. 
So in that moment when the veil was torn, that represented the most holy of holies where only the high priest could enter into the presence of God. That veil was torn so that you and myself can enter into the presence of God. The Holy Spirit can fill us and now we can take the presence of God into our workplaces because you are there. The presence of God is within you and if you are standing in your office, the presence of God you're bringing to the people around you. Jesus Christ gave his life to erase those lines. That's the very reason why we can pray that let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We are called to bring the kingdom of God into our workplaces. It's about saying yes to God on a daily basis and that sanctifies your work. It's not so much of what you are doing. Point number five. Do your work as unto God. Kids who are in school, do your work, your homework as unto God. So the Bible has a lot to say about integrity and truth and honesty in the workplace, but a, a scripture that all of us can apply into our workplace is Colossians 3 from verse 22. Slaves, obey your human masters in everything. Don't work only while being watched as people pleases, but work wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, even if you are retired at the moment, whatever you do, if you do something, even if you serve at church, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ for the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done and there is no favoritism. So none of us can really say that we are slaves. So that means if, if Paul could say to a slave to do his job in this manner, we can apply to all of our job situations, no matter who your, who your boss is, how um, bad he is in your eyes, we can apply this. Do your work as unto God, wholeheartedly, not people pleases. If we look at the God of rest, my first point is this, the Bible, the, in the Bible there's a great balance, there's a significant balance between work and rest. And the Bible even cautions us against idleness. 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 10 says, if anyone is not willing to work, let them not eat. Ephesians 4 verse 28, let the thief no longer steal. Instead, he is to do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need. Now, if you are currently looking for a job, pray about it. God is faithful and entrusts that situation into his hands. But actively pursue seeking a job and God will meet you at that place. The Bible also cautions us against workalism. Many of us, that's us. We just have to prove ourselves, climb the corporate ladder, be on the phone, email all the time. Psalm 127 verse two says, in vain you get up early and stay up late working on your phone all the time, working hard to have, have enough food. Yes, he gives sleep to the one he loves. Number two, God himself rested. So again, that scripture that we read in Genesis 2 verse 2, it says that God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested from all his work of creation. Now, when we say that God rested, it doesn't mean that he abandoned the universe. He still sustained the universe. And it also doesn't imply that God was tired. That word actually literally means to cease. It implies that his creative work was completed. Now, God made the seas and the dry land. And then he watched, or he looked at it and he said, it is good. He made the stars, the sun. He made the, the um, birds of the sky and he said, it is good. He made the, um, 
the animals, and he said, it is good. But in verse 31, God saw that all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. He was utterly satisfied with what is done. Absolutely satisfied with the doing. And that is the definition for deep rest. Utterly satisfied with what is done. Can we ever say that? So point number three, that leads me to point number three. What is the problem? The problem is the absence of deep rest. So in actual fact, the physical work that we need to do does not really make us weary. Our real pro problem is not the presence of work, it's the absence of a deep rest. And if we are honest, all of us, human beings, we have this like inner machine of self-centeredness. We just need to prove ourselves to ourselves and to people, other people around us. I want to have value. I want to prove that I can make it in the world. I want to be successful. And you get your identity through something. You want to know who you are. You want to somehow prove that I have value. And it's like inner tor turmoil and a striving, the work beneath the work to prove that you are somebody. And even the good works that we do, it most of the time is from a selfish place where we want to prove and appease God and make him see us. Or we think like, maybe then I can be a good enough or Maybe then I can get into heaven. And we witness a deep restlessness in most human beings. Now, until we figure out that you cannot save yourself by the works that you are doing, there will be anxiety, there will be strife, and there will be a restlessness. And you will not be able to enter his rest. Because we can never say, it is finished. Point number four, Jesus finished the job. On the cross, he said, it is finished finished. Some of you need to hear that today. John 17 verse 4, I have glorified you on the earth by completing the work you have gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with that glory I had with you before the world existed. No human work can redeem you. The finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross that brings us redemption. Ephesians 2 from verse 8, it's a powerful scripture. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. When you are in Christ, now the good works can flow, but the good works doesn't prove you and the, the good works doesn't bring the rest. And the good works will never save you. Jesus Christ came to live the life that you and I were supposed to live. He imputed your sin on himself so that he can impute his righteousness to your account. So you know, if you can remember that statement about that Timothy Keller made, unless you find the biblical view of work, you will never find rest. The biblical view of work is this, it is his work, not mine, and I rest based on his works. It is finished. Point number five, Jesus Christ is our Sabbath rest. Now, if you're going to look at Luke 6, you can read it there. What happened is Jesus and his disciples, they were in the grain fields. They were a bit hungry, but it was a Sabbath. But they picked the grains and they started to eat the grains. The Pharisees didn't like this because it was against the rules and the regulations of the Sabbath. On that day, And they said to him, how can you do this? And Jesus gave them, um, said a few things, but then he said this, the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. And then later on, on another Sabbath, they sort of 
set up a trap for him and there was a man with a disformed um, hand and they were now watching, what is Jesus gonna do? And Jesus just saw right through them and they were looking or uh, seeing whether Jesus is now gonna heal because it was also not allowed to heal on the Sabbath. And Jesus told them, is it lawful to do good or to do evil? And then of course he said, stretch out your hand and he restored. It's not about the Sabbath and the Sabbath rules or whether or not we are keeping the Sabbath. What Jesus actually saying is, I am the one that created the Sabbath. All the Sabbath regulations pointed to me. I am God. I am the God of rest, the Lord of rest. And I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm restoring. If and only then, if you enter the eternal rest, and you stop working for your salvation, only then the principle of Sabbath rest can apply in your life. And then you can externally practice maybe a day of rest in your life, but it will not make a difference. Why would you do Sabbath in your life if you do not honor the one who created Sabbath? It doesn't make sense. I mean, the very reason we, we set time to rest is to honor God, to make a proclamation that you are God, Lord, you are in control of the universe, so I can relax. I'm not in control. You will make sure that the universe will keep on ticking. Another reason why we can bring in Sabbath is like, Sabbath is an act of liberation. If you don't rest, you are a slave. And most of us battle to say no to the world and the cultures around us, and we are enslaved by the systems of this world. It's an act of trusting God, an act of liberation. And I want to grow in, in learning how to do Sabbath in my life, but this is not the point of the message today. It's like you first have to enter that eternal rest in Jesus Christ. He is our Sabbath rest. God now can sign, come. Matthew 11 verse 28, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Some of you really need to come today. There's this inner inner striving, your whole life you've never been good enough. Your whole life you've been seeking. Jesus Christ says, come to me, those who are, are weary. So what do we do now? We as Solid Ground Church wants to make a difference. We want to, all of us want to make a difference, but I believe this is key. It takes us to, to recognize the fact that my work is worship. It takes you to recognize and realize that you are uh, in ministry where you at. We are the salt and the light of the world. We're not redeemed out of this world. We are redeemed for the world. So you, if we only think worship is between these four walls, we will never reach the society around us. If solid ground is gonna make a difference in Middleburg, you and I need to take the gospel and live it. You need to take the presence of Christ within you and be the hands and feet of Jesus wherever you are. We need a revelation of our workplace that God has planned. It's not a waste of time. Work is created before sin. And God can use each and every one of us in our workplace. I think while the band is gonna minister a song to us, 
just to reflect. And then I'm going to call, there's two groups of people we're going to pray for. There's a group of people that really needs to enter that eternal rest. Stop trying to prove yourself. Stop thinking that you can save yourself. You need to become. You need to sit at Jesus' feet and recognize that He has done every single work that you ever needed to do. He has done on the cross. It is finished. So while we stand and worship, you guys can come forward and we're going to pray for you. And then secondly, if you just want somebody to stand with you and say, I need a new new version of my workplace. I want to be sent out to be, to be different. I need a new view of God in my workplace. We're going to stand and pray. And even if it fills up as people pray, you can come and we will minister and pray together. Let's sing. Amen.